Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Algebras Investments podcast. My name is Douglas Branson and I'm pleased to be joined again by Sylvia Merler, who is our Head of ESG and Policy Research. Hi Sylvia, thanks for joining today. Hello Doug. So look, according to the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, responsible investing is, and I quote, an approach to investing that explicitly acknowledges the relevance to the investor of environmental, social and governance factors and of the long-term health and stability of the market as a whole. Considering this in the context of our role as a fund management business, this essentially means that we undertake to offer clients access to an investment solution designed to create social, environmental and economic value that is sustainable over the long term. We'll get into this in a later episode of this mini-series, but in the meantime, Sylvia and I will today discuss the topic of responsible investing more generally. And Sylvia, look, I'd like to start with quite a general question here. ESG and responsible or sustainable investing is widely discussed across sectors and geographies and is a major part of many conversations in our industry. Can you explain what it's about and its influence on asset management? Yes, of course. So um, actually, the the study that you were referring to in your introduction is really spot on on that uh, concept. The idea behind uh, responsible investing is that of factoring in, um, in the context of the investment process, a number of non-financial but potentially very material factors that have to do with environmental sustainability, social impact, and obviously also Um, good governance practices of the companies that you invest in. So at the core, the idea of um, what is often referred to as ESG investing is precisely to try and identify either risks that may come from those non-financial but potentially very material factors and try to mitigate those risks by um, avoiding, for example, investing in companies that may be heavily exposed to those risks. Um, or also use those non-financial factors to identify investment opportunities and growth opportunities that are linked to these um, macro trends having to do with environmental sustainability or uh, social impact. Understood. And the, in terms of algebra itself, what have we done to embed ESG principles in the firm's day-to-day operations and how the firm functions? So maybe just give our listeners the elevator explanation on what we've done and what we're doing, please. Yes, of course. So from an operational standpoint, and meaning the way that we run uh, our business, there's a lot of indicators that we monitor, for example, our energy consumption, whether our energy is sourced from renewable um, production sources or other uh, types of, of energy. Um, and uh, we also calculated the firm's carbon footprint every year and we convert that number into a number of trees that we plant every year to offset the emissions that we produce. So that is something that we do to make sure that we have as little an environmental impact as possible in the way that we do things that we run um, our operations. And then, of course, Algebra is being an asset manager. The most important side of what we do is investing. And so there's been a lot of work um, going on in the past two and a half years on integrating those uh, non-financial factors that I mentioned earlier into the investment process of all our strategies. Um, and I would say on this part of the ESG integration, I would only highlight a couple of things. So Algebris is a member of the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. Um, as part of this initiative, we have taken a commitment to manage an increasingly larger share of our AUM in line with achieving net zero emissions by 2050 or sooner. So that is obviously a commitment with a real economic impact that also um, feeds into the way that we um, look at portfolio management and uh, generally across the entire investment process. Um, And then um, obviously we also use our uh, top-down macro level analysis of ESG relevant trends to identify any uh, new investment opportunities, investment trends that may be Um, emerging as a result of um, more interest both in the policy and in the financial world towards this this non-financial factors. Excellent, thank you. And I'd like to broaden the discussion a little bit now. 
So lots of countries have proposed regulations aimed at tackling climate change. If we take the main regions of the world, so the US, the EU, um, the UK and, and Asia, how has ESG evolved in these geographies from a regulatory standpoint? And I suppose, what do you see coming down the line in terms of how that regulation will impact investment? So I think there's two sides really to the story. There is one public investment side. Um, all major jurisdictions are putting out major investment plans uh, that will be undertaken by governments, by the public sector. And these investment plans, they share the common objective of effectively achieving an energy transition, a net zero transition. So a transition towards an economic model that can be compatible with long-term environmental sustainability. Um, Possibly the most um, discussed initiative in this area has been the US uh, Inflation Reduction Act. So that is obviously a major investment initiative in the order of $400 billion uh, that will be undertaken by the US government. Um, but in Europe, the uh, governments are also discussing similar similar initiatives. And so there will be a response that, at least in terms of size, as far as we know so far, will be comparable to the to the US initiative, even if details are not yet known. And other regions in the in the world, they also are uh, pretty much following the same the same trend here. Uh, the other side of the story, so besides the public investment story, there's also a regulatory side um, that has to do with private investment. Um, and there, I would say there's more, um, there's a bit more of a gap in the sense that I think Europe is way ahead in terms of um, regulating sustainable investments, in terms of requirements of transparency and disclosures that private investors have to abide by when it, uh, when it comes to these things. Um, and other regions of the world are also working on similar regulation. The UK, for example, is also fairly advanced. But I would say Europe, because the whole process started earlier, is probably the jurisdiction where we're seeing this coming towards um, completion much sooner than, than elsewhere. You mentioned energy transition in, in your last um, comment. Where does the green transition fit into all of this? How does it affect the companies involved in that specific area of sustainability? This is one of the uh, macro trends that we think will be extremely important for the next uh, five to 10 years, definitely, because the policy direction is clear. It's been set very clearly at the uh, international level and across different countries, they all share a similar, um, a similar goal of achieving a net zero economy uh, by pretty much um, th the same time horizon. And so what this means for companies that are operating in activities that will be either instrumental or central to the, to the energy transition is that there will be Obviously, a lot of interest um, from both public, uh, public and private investors in those companies, in those areas, and um, in those fields that will be really <coughs> central to achieving this, this um, high-level policy objective. Okay, great. So look, many thanks for your time, Sylvia, and thank you also to our listeners. For those of you who are interested in learning more about Aldebris' approach, to matters relating to ESG and sustainable investing. We have an area of our website dedicated to the subject, and we also publish a regular paper called The Green Leaf that Sylvia and her team write. As mentioned earlier, this is the first of a four-part mini-series, and I look forward to inviting Sylvia back for the second episode in the not-too-distant future. So until next time.